So we've got about another 40 minutes or so, and um, I'm going to put the uh, questions out to the audience in about 10, 15 minutes. Um, but before we do that, just to sort of kick the discussion off, um, really, um, I suppose, um, the future. That's what we want to talk about here. Um, th this panel is entitled, How Do You Keep Up? When I think of the, uh, the growth that we're talking about here, if I think about 205 737 maxes. I don't know how, how on earth anybody's going to keep up with that sort of pace. But in fact, all of the airlines uh, that are sitting here with me right now have massive expansion plans um, any way you look at it. So, um, so really, how do you keep up? Um, what do you all think is the outlook going forward? And maybe we'll kick off with, with Patrick. Where, where do you see the, the market going in the next couple of years? Well, first of all, I think that we've, we've seen some unbelievably crazy things happening in Asia. Yeah. When you see the or aircraft orders of Lion Air and Melindo, and with all due respect, Spice, you say, what are they doing? Mm. I'm, I'm a believer in planned expansion. You do it mm. slowly. You do it on a planned basis. Mm. You order aircraft on, on, on long term. I'm going to use the example of Ryanair. Ryanair is now at 351 operating aircraft. Yeah. So they have 200 on, on order. The relative position is much more <laughs> reasonable and phase program of arrivals are meant to replace the original aircraft and to add the volume increases as they go mm. forward. So in the next year, they're taking about 50 aircraft, mm. but of 25 of those are going to replace existing aircraft, and 25 are going to add to new routes, new developments, and everything else. In the case of Peach, we're on a smaller scale for obvious reasons, but we're going from the 18 we have today to 35 um, in Five, years, five or six years' time. Right? Yeah. Well, we're bringing them in on a planned basis to do the operation we know we're planning to do. We have a mm. plan that has that. Mm. If some new opportunity comes up, we can go back out to the market and get the airplanes we need. Mm. The leasing market has drastically changed. You can now get aircraft literally next week, next month, next year. Mm. It's very different from what it used to be. Mm. And I don't think the way to do that is to buy orders in advance with the kind of purchase price and deposits and commitment you have to make, it's a bit too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great uh, kickoff, Patrick. So really, Ajay, so it's, it's too much. You know, and what, Patrick, there's a lot of truth in, in all of those comments. I mean, but you're, you're kind of on the other side of the page saying that, well, you know, I've done the deal with Airbus. I've got, I've got the, I'm Boeing, sorry. I've got, the, I've got these aircraft coming in. I've got a really good rate. What's your, what's your so, thinking uh, on this? You know, Firstly, if you look at the macro uh, situation in India, we have 1.3 billion people. Mm. We have 400 commercial aircraft. Uh, China has close to 5,000 commercial aircraft. Mm. An airline like Southwest has 800 planes. Mm. So, you know, we are starting with a very, very low base. 3% people flying, just very, very few aircraft. Mm. And no matter what we do, uh, you know, we are going to run short of aircraft. The total number of aircraft which have, which have been ordered by Indian carriers is, is roughly around 500 planes. Mm. So even with those, and those 500 get delivered over the next eight to 10 years. So 10 years down the ro road, we will still be at 900 to 1,000 planes, even if you presume that nothing gets replaced, which is not the case. Mm. So we feel that uh, we need the aircraft in India. Uh, the lease versus buy option is something, of course, that we looked at. There is a considerable benefit, a significant benefit when you buy the plates. You get them a lot cheaper. Uh, if you decide to do a sale and lease pack, you know, there is a lot of cash that you get up front because you've got the planes cheaper. Uh, the, the, the buy option also enables you to renegotiate maintenance contracts which are key, uh, you know, a key component of the cost of the planes that we have. So, uh, you know, we've done this consciously. Uh, we think that, uh, uh, we, we already have one example in, in, in India, mm. Indigo, mm. which ordered a significant number of planes when people said, look, are these guys crazy? Yeah, they, 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 they went and ordered 100 planes uh, initially yeah. when they started. <clears throat> and, yeah. and this was a time when everybody else was saying, okay, you know, you need to do it in, in, in stages, maybe five planes or 10 planes at a time. They went in more than 100. Yeah. And they showed that by doing that, today, you know, they started with a capital of $5 million. Mm. Today, they are a $5 billion company. Mm. Mm. 
So 10 years down the road, primarily because of the, the, the strategy they adopted in uh, fleet acquisition mm. and the, the contracts that they signed as a consequence of that, mm. uh, you know, they, they have a certain market, market cap. Mm -hmm. And I guess um, when we're talking about aircraft, uh, the difference between the new aircraft coming in and the old aircraft that they're replacing, it's, it's very significant in terms of running costs because of the, the fuel burn for a start. I think you're looking at very significant improvements on fuel burn from, from new aircraft you've got coming in. What, what, what would that be, Les? That would be... Well, I think uh, we, we've got quite an interesting fleet story. You know, we initially started in 2012 and 13 with the idea that we would be flying NEOs in 2016, 2017. So mm -hmm. at that time, the management uh, tried to lease a lot of short-term interim A320 older CEOs to get mm -hmm. them, bridge them to those NEOs. But uh, starting in about 2015 and then into early 2016, we began to realize that uh, that possibly would, might not be the way to go in early 16, especially with the early challenges with the aircraft. So we began to reevaluate that decision and decide, well, if we can't get NEOs in 16 where we want, what, what, what should we do? And uh, for us, we made the decision to, to get everything we want on a NEO except the engines, which is the new CO for us. In other words, we have the 186 seat configuration now. We have the, uh, we've gone to the higher takeoff weight as well, which gives us the additional range. Uh, so we've got an identical aircraft that if we ever do get NEOs, then all we're changing is the engines. Mm. And with these newer aircraft that already have the sharklets, we're seeing about a 5%, sometimes 6% fuel burn in uh, savings over the old existing COs. And uh, in Vietnam, we only run about a 1.2 uh, sector length. Mm. So uh, combine that, uh, even once we do see NEOs, we're only gonna see about a 8 to 9% fuel savings. So again, that's, that's not very much for us. If you compare it to an older CO, surely you'll see the 15%, but you can get the 5 or 6% uh, with the COs that are out there now, and uh, it gives us the ability to bring the new aircraft in, the new technology, and get to the 186 seats, which certainly helps in the, yeah. uh, in the LCC world. So that, that's currently where we're going, and we're still agonizing over the decision, as one of the gentlemen said, when to get into NEOs. I think, that's, I think we're all gonna be drugged there kicking and screaming one day, but uh, how long can we put it off is... Uh, is that's what we're looking at. Question. I guess uh, <clears throat> when I think about Japan and India, I guess, I guess the real thing is that uh, <clears throat> in India, you've got 20% per annum growth <clears throat> running on the domestic market, whereas in Japan, it will be, I guess, less than 3%. So I think that really must drive a very different approach to bringing in additional units. Although, of course, we have seen massive inbound growth in Japan very recently because, of course, the yen has depreciated and again, because, because the number of years, 14 low-cost airlines going into Japan now, yeah. and they're all at growth rates, double and triple what the established carriers are doing. Yeah. So you're up in the 10 to 15% annual average growth. And I don't think that's gonna stop. And with the yeah. c current commitment from government to develop tourism, that's going to continue and may even step up further. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm really interested in the low-cost model, Emily, and, I, and I'm, I'm particularly interested in what you said about competing with Korean airlines. And I, and I, it, do you see more and more long-haul, low-cost leisure destinations for for Jin Air using your triple sevens? I mean, what's and is that something that's going to uh, that must upset your <laughs> your sort of partners in in Korean? Well, we have to utilize our triple seven fleet. So that and the one big advantage for Jin Air to have a triple seven is that the other LCCs in Korea they all have seven three sevens. So instead, when we only had 737s, we were all fighting for the same destination. So we're, because we now have the 777, we're able to go places where um, the other LCCs can't come. Of course, that makes us compete with Korean Air and the full service um, mm. carriers, but still, like I said before, we won't be flying to um, New York anytime soon. No. But we'll be um, going forward to the, the steady leisure markets, mm. and hopefully the, the um, tourist destinations that don't have big seasonality where you can go year round. And th that's how we'll take care of our long, um, that's how we're trying to strengthen our long, re long haul mm. flights. Mm. And uh, we, we talked about social media very briefly earlier on, and it was a big topic of conversation yesterday at the conference. Where, where do you see social media adding value to what you do in Jin Air? Well, basically <coughs> social media is one of the best place to differentiate ourselves from the other airlines, especially the other LCCs, because 
to a lot of our customers, to our young customers, like the millennials, um, they all use social network. And basically, like, I personally believe that all airlines, they're basically the same. There's, it's really hard to be different in the service that we offer, at least in Korea. So um, for the branding part, the social network is the biggest place where we can actually be different. Mm -hmm. And we might do the same type of activity, but how we present ourselves, how we put the message, the kind of events that we do, makes a po it totally creates a different brand aura and a very different brand image. As you can tell, I'm a marketing person, so um, we put a lot of emphasis on our social network and the kind of message that we send to our customers. Mm -hmm. And because of those efforts, um, among the, if you do the brand, um, brand surveys in Korea, just for the LCCs, the, the other five of them are all pretty much in the same area as cheap prices and no frills, while Jinair by itself is just, our key characteristic is different. We don't know what exactly that different is, but it's a big, um, for a marketing perspective, it's a very important brand asset that we have. Does it, does it enable you to get higher prices or yes, more yes. traction or what? Yes. What? Yeah. Um, other than if, so, so for the people that don't know that Genera is part of the Hanjin group and with same as Korean Air, you know, we're fighting with price and it's not just Korean LCCs, but every other airline that's flying into Korea. Mm. So because we have, I truly believe that, you know, at the end of the day, if you, if you compete with price, then you're going to lose to a competitor that com comes with a lower price. And you know we don't. There's a limit to how much price then we can actually lower. You know if you want to stay profitable. So it all comes back to the promise that you keep with the customers, and that's all part of the brand. And that's what marketing should be. That's very very interesting. I'm I'm, I'm dying to hear what Patrick's got to say about this because it's. I imagine you have a completely different view on this. Not really. No, but, but social media is the dominant force. Yeah. And we we exploit it to the maximum we can because. Our market is the millennials and the young people, and people talking about it is more important than any advertising or any promotion yeah, or anything yeah. else. Well, price is equally important, and one of the commitments that Peach is making is in the Reiner, we will always have the lowest price, mm. right? You won't necessarily get it on the day you want it, not even on the flight you want it, but you will have a low price mm. in and around the time you want to travel. Mm. And that makes the first choice to check if yeah. you're going to a particular yeah. destination that Peach is known or you know about it because of the <clears throat> social media, mm. you go and check there, mm. right? Mm. And if you've got it right, then you'll get that customer. Yeah. If you don't have it at the right price, the right day, or the, not unavailable, then you may lose them. But you mm. give them the option of going another day. And we're talking about highly flexible people, people, young people going for weekends, going for parties, going flexible in terms of their travel, visiting their friends and relatives, all of that kind of thing. It's not the traditional business market. No, no, exactly. Very, very interesting. Ajay, the Indian market, of course, is a huge user of social media, very enthusiastic of all things internet. What, what's, what's your experience been on, on social media? Well, we, we do a tremendous amount of work on mm. social media. I think we, we use social media to study consumer behavior mm. uh, and try and target consumers based on you know, what they're talking about and what they're buying. Uh, we use it increasingly to sell ancillary products. Um, we use it to sell our seats. Uh, mm. Facebook is one of the largest channels for our ticket sales mm. at this point. Uh, Google and Facebook would probably be larger than perhaps even our own direct channel sometimes. Uh, we mm. use it to promote weak flights. Mm. Uh, it's just a terrific tool. Uh, we, we are using a lot of analytics uh, now mm. uh, to, to uh, uh, figure out what, where the gaps are and what we can sell which we are not selling. Uh, it is a differentiator, uh, for sure. Uh, I think uh, in India, the market is intensely competitive, so prices uh, you know, equalize pretty quickly. So if you go on an uh, online travel agent website, you'll find that pretty much all the airlines are selling at the same price. Mm. And so you need to do that little bit extra, uh, and, and that's something that you can do on social media. I think uh, the young people in India respond well uh, when, when, when you communicate with them on social media, and they need to know that you are responsive as well. So when they react about a flight and they get a response back quickly uh, from the airline on social media, mm. they, they know that uh, uh, you know, this is an airline which is, which is for them, mm. uh, in a sense. Mm. Mm. Very interesting. 
Patrick, going back to your comment, I thought it was a very interesting one about the ancillary revenue and hotels and what have you, and, and really commissionable revenues. Um, one of the things that we've been looking at very closely um, in IATA is what we call transparency in payment. And when we've been looking at the relative cost of different channels, credit cards, e-wallets, um, going direct, going via agents, there's a lot of um, blurring around what these channels actually really cost. Um, what, what's, your, what's been your experience in? Well, we, you know, we're, we're rebels in the cause in, in that case because we're not interested in the travel agents, right? Yeah. But we facilitate travel agents making bookings online, mm -hmm. right? And they can offer the customer choice on that screen or from that mm -hmm. choice, but particularly people going direct will have it automatically. So we want the people to come directly. Mm. In fact, we, 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 we try to block out screen scraping and other things that is a phenomenon all around the world where people take the, the Ryanair package or the Peach package and then price it up and do their That's own right. thing with it. And they mark it up. That's what we try to yeah. Yeah. And we will take law course, we will take to competition authorities, we'll deal with that to address these kind of things. So we're constantly having battles with Google on <coughs> what they can show and what they can offer and what they can make available. So, in principle, it's direct booking. Yeah, NDC is good, and I know the reason for it, and I know the background to it. Mm. But in the case of Peach Airlines, we don't have to do it. No. Right? So we're not, we're not going to encourage the travel agent direct booking. No, no. So and do you, and on those, is it mostly credit cards for your, your payment form, or is it? With, with the mass range of plenty of cards, but we now have the Peach card. Oh, is that right? Very it's our own dedicated. Not a frequent flyer program, a peach card for use yeah. in department stores, any, any kind of stores, yeah. accumulating points and relevant, which will be redeemed. So peach will make money, yeah. not from the loyalty program per se, but from the redemption of those miles and points and everything else. And of mm. course you can buy the tickets on peach with the peach card, mm. right? and mm. you can get discounts and you can get benefits mm. from doing that. But that's the move we made. It's a mm. dedicated peach credit card for two of the major Japanese banks. Yeah. That's very interesting. And of course, you know, Qantas have done the same thing. I mean, in, in Australia now, Qantas are launching amazingly for a, an aviation group healthcare products because of the penetration of their card scheme. In Vietnam, though, where, where are we with payment? It's still sort of stuck in, <laughs> stuck, stuck back in 20 years ago. or. Yes, it's a, it's a bit of a challenging uh, challenge for us with payment. Uh, most of the country still traveling uh, folks in the country don't use credit cards. There's a, a big deployment of bank cards through the country, so most of the payment options we present have a way for them to pay with their bank cards, but it's, uh, it's still very much a cash-based society. You know? as, as a good example, one of the new technologies that we've uh, really rolled out recently is the, uh, the iPad check-in. So we're trying to revolutionize the uh, our ticket our check-in area such that it would look perhaps like you're uh, when you enter the hall here where you have the little stand you'd have someone standing there with an iPad and yeah. a belt to uh, to check you in and swipe your credit card but uh, for Vietnam we had to add, add a money belt to the belt yeah. because you also have to collect the cash and keep up with all the cash so uh, that's been something we had to add that we don't have in our other markets it's just a credit card swipe so uh, it's always something we have to consider for Vietnam it's very much a cash based society still so mm -hmm. very interesting i'd like i'd like to throw questions open to the floor now um, has anybody got any, any questions that they, they would like to ask? Yes, this gentleman here. Can we get a mic to... Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much uh, for all the wonderful insights. With the cabin products taking the uh, back seat on low-cost airlines, so seat back IFE obviously is not available. People don't want to pay for a wireless IFE anymore because they bring content on their own devices. What's missing on low-cost airlines is in-seat power because I have my content on my phone, I can watch it, but there's no power. And I'm cramped up in uh, the pitch seats that you have. Is in-seat power something that low-cost airlines are looking into or would, or is that an expense too expensive? So in-seat power for, for low-cost air, air, aircraft. I don't think it's happening in Beach. We don't have to. We don't, we don't, that's, it's a different the market that you're dealing with and everything else. And anything that costs money, we're not going to do it. <laughs> Unless we're going to get a return from it. Yeah. 
Emily, uh, power on, because your, your IFE is using people's, yeah, do you, what do you do about recharging well, devices? Well, some of our planes, our, the older planes, don't have the AC plugs, but our newer, our newer um, planes are actually, they do have it, so hopefully, um, if you fly a, a newer, like a 777, our generic 777, you won't have that complaint. I'm sorry if you have ever tried it. And it's, I mean, I think because we're so like dependent on our smartphones, our electronic devices, like, you know, iPads or whatnot, I think it doesn't, I don't think it costs that much to add a plug into the, when you're ordering a plane, does it? So I think it's something that's a necessary cost, at least from my perspective. Mm. Liz, do you, do you if we could just uh, find a way to put a meter on it and charge uh, <laughs> charge them for how much you charge, I think, yes, the LCCs would jump right into it. But uh, yes, we actually looked at uh, specking our new aircraft with in-flight power, and it actually is quite expensive uh, when oh, you right. start adding the seat. And also the weight of the devices uh, and things that go along with it. Uh, mm. We couldn't see a return on investment, and we couldn't see any way to charge for it or or even advertise that it's there other than just people get used to it, word of mouth, and people like it, maybe they fly your airline. That was the argument, but the other argument uh, was return on investment and short yeah. short sector links for us don't uh, doesn't really seem to be valuable. But again, if we could charge you two dollars for a charge or something, then maybe <laughs> that'd be something to look at. The, the other feature to remember about low cost airlines: you're talking about relatively short journeys. The average journey is two hours. Yeah. So the charging yeah. is not particularly. If you're doing a 12 hour or longer, that becomes a different matter. Hmm. I don't know. I think it's, it's the philosophy and the status, the tra strategy of each airline, but at least for us, we're finding that in the beginning when we first started, when Jinair first started, there were a lot of critiques on mm. how we're not low cost, like low frills, but we're not full service either. And there was a lot of speculation about how successful Jinair will be. But as you can see, um, that middle range, that hybrid, boutique, whatever you want to call it, mm. is actually not doing that bad. We're actually, and I think there's always that customer that there are always the low frills, the low frills, and there's always that premium, but there will always be that middle people. And in marketing, it's called the Goldilocks effect. That's why, you know, every product for a camera, for example, there'll always be a low cost, a high premium, and always the middle one. Yeah. And the strategy is that people will basically choose the middle price because, you know, they don't, they can't choose between the cheap one and the expensive one. Mm. And I think that's the kind of, um, that Jenner, like a lot of airlines these days are actually going into. It's mm, very interesting. Are there any other, any other questions from the, from the floor? Does that answer your question, by the way? See what the, what the story oh, is. Uh, okay, so from SpiceJet's perspective, uh, you know, we've looked at it, and uh, our issues are uh, basically that nobody's gonna pay for it. Uh, it's complicated because you know you put all that wiring in. It's it's weight on the plane. It you know it's more fuel burn for us. Uh, from a maintenance perspective, it's a, it's a nightmare because you need to keep checking uh, every time you know the, something happens to one socket. You go looking for where the fault is. We just think it's not worth the trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a gentleman here. Hi, yeah. I'm interested to hear from the panel how you view in-flight in internet connectivity, um, whether you see it as a tangible driver of your ancillary revenues. Oh, interesting one. So, uh, you know, for us, uh, for the new planes, uh, uh, we are building in that capability. All right. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we have a really young country. A lot of people want to use the internet. We think that they will pay for internet on, on board. Uh, and so we are building it in, uh, again, because of the large number of aircraft we've or or ordered, uh, we have a very good uh, pricing mechanism. And you think they'll, yeah, you think they'll pay for it and therefore yes. it'll be another. We feel that another. people will pay for it. And at the price at which we've got the system, we think it's well worth it. Okay, that's very interesting. And, Patrick. And, and we don't, uh, again, can you get <laughs> the money for it? The world is changing. You know, yeah. you could charge and get money for this time, time, time ago. But everybody has their own smartphone, their own tablet, or whatever it might be. Everyone has the capability. Wi-Fi is becoming more and more feasible and practical. Some parts of the world it works great. That no problem in Japan. We facilitate 
loading movies at airports or Kansai specifically, yeah. for the tablet or whatever you want to do, if you want to do it, mm. you pay, you pay a slot machine to, mm. to get it. But that's all we do, mm. and I don't see us opening up that capability. I don't see it as a money earner, mm. and if it's not going to mon earn money, then you would, do it. Why, why do it? Yeah, okay. Uh, Emily, what about what about Gina? Any plans there or? We've looked into it. We were actually going to do it, but the only problem was that. It was very, it's still very slow. And as you know, Korea has one of the fastest um, broad, the internet connectivity speed. And so, and our Korean customers are very, very picky. So if the, the service doesn't match their um, needs and you know, they're gonna pay for it, there's gonna be a lot more complaints. So we'd rather not offer yeah. it and not get complaints. Liz, Jetstar? Yes, as he says, uh, or as everyone said, there's been a lot of studies done at Jetstar, but as we see the the issue is it's so different depending on what part of the world you're in. I think as everyone said, certain parts of the world it's a great uh, system. You can use ground-based uh, sources for internet, uh, you know, hitting to the radio towers like in the U.S. and Australia, but uh, at least for us in Vietnam there's nothing like that. It would have to be with satellites and some of the better satellite systems are not yet available in this part of the world. Yeah, right. So uh, what we did put in would be, uh, you know, huge dishes on the aircraft with low bandwidth and mm. we think at the end of the day it would be hard to charge what that's mm. worth for. But again, it, it very much depends on what part of the world you're in. I mm. think some places are much better, uh, have the infrastructure there to support, uh, support the system. Yeah, sure. Again, at the end of the day, it's if you can get uh, the money back for it. So. Yeah, yeah. We've got time for one more question, I think. Does anybody... Just one quick thing I'd like to raise then, uh, really is this whole issue of qualified personnel. And um, I wanted to start with Patrick because um, in Japan in, uh, I think it was 2014, we had a situation where thousands of flights were being canceled in the country by all airlines because there simply weren't enough qualified pilots. And it seems that Japan came through that and we've now got enough pilots to provide the full range of services with all of the airlines. And I wondered uh, what the learnings were from that, Patrick, and you know, what, what was the sort of background to that? Well, even, even Peach fell into that same trap. Oh, we you? assumed we would have the pilots, not for broadcast or anywhere else, but mm. if it wasn't for JAL's crisis and the mm. pilots being let go, mm. Peach would have had a really, could have had a troublesome start, mm. but they got pilots from JAL. Mm. Now many of those pilots are getting to retirement age and the first officers have to come in and we have to promote and we have to get the training. So recruitment and training it is a problem. Mm. We have planned our aircraft fleet on the assumptions with regard to the pilots and we've made it manageable. We're not taking any risks in relation to that there. Mm. We will have a fleet plan that allies with the uh, flight crew plan yeah. and we're going to hopefully we'll be able to manage it. But there's uncertainty out there mm. because the poaching, if I would call it, probably not the right word, but the special offers that are going on in China and other parts of mm. the, this region are very enticing and very mm. attractive, but they're all short term. And, and we, we're anxious to do the Japanese type thing, to get people in, train them from the start, get them totally qualified, lock them into the JCAB system, and there for life if possible, but certainly for a prolonged life. And as we try to make Beach, it's a great place to work and that includes pilots and flight crews and working with everyone else. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of shaking of heads around here. Is this something that you're all, you're all pilots? This is, is, a, this is one of the biggest challenges yeah. in India. Uh, you know, when you see 25% growth, there's no way you're creating pilots at that pace. Yeah. Uh, so we have a really large program. Uh, mm. We have a training academy and we are training pilots. Mm. The problem really happens with the commanders. Mm. Uh, because while you can get people in at the base level, train them to be first officers, to get first officers to graduate to being commanders, and then becoming experienced commanders, yeah, uh, that that becomes a big problem. And uh, you know, we've we've actually government has actually stepped in in India and uh, regulated this by by mandating that there should be a six month notice before a pilot leaves an airline and goes to another one. And that's stabilized the market a little bit, but it's a constant uh, challenge which we have to fight. Liz, with your pilot and safety hat on, I'm sure you've got some interesting insights on this yes, one. We're very similar to everyone here, at least on the operational side, uh, when we do our risk assessments for our operational growth over the next couple of years, that's our single biggest unmitigatable risk, I guess you would say, mm -hmm. for, on the operation side is that 
as you said, the ability of qualified captains. At the rate we're all expanding, there's a huge demand in the world for direct entry captains. Mm. And most of the plans you see in the world that people put into place are around cadets or mm. things like that, which are all great. Uh, but to be honest, that's, we have a lot of those type pilots, uh, entry level pilots. You need the what higher. we don't have are the uh, yeah. experienced uh, captains who can walk in and with a minimal amount of training be a direct entry captain. There's yeah. a huge shortage in the world right now mm. there. So. Again, fortunately, with our partners, Vietnam Airlines and Qantas, I think we, uh, we have enough mitigations in place. And uh, mm. as he said, making it a good place to work seems to be the thing. Also, salaries that we're seeing are going up, which aren't helping the cost, but that's mm. supply and demand. But, uh, but yeah, big challenge going forward, mm. absolutely. Mm. Well, uh, we, uh, we've run out of time now, so um, I'd like to thank Les and Ajay and Patrick and Emily for really interesting insights. It's been uh, very enlightening hearing about the different experiences. And I mean, the big takeout for this for me is that uh, we have lots of different types of model, types of markets. I think everybody knew that about Asia Pacific. And uh, there are many different ways of, of creating the best model for the market. And um, I wish all of our uh, panelists the greatest success in the future with all of their endeavors. And please join me in a, in a round of applause for them. Thank you.